I'm one of these people who believe that Mississippi is, is a very uh, beautiful place, but also a very terrible place, like all at the same time. Um, and some of the things that we have been able to accomplish, particularly on the political front, uh, is actually a result of the terror, uh, believe it or not. Um, because there's a, there's a certain degree, at least in Jackson, uh, there's a certain degree of convincing people uh, around some of their defensive interests that we honestly just don't have to do. Right? Like people are very clear that there are some forces who don't fully believe all of us are human and they don't mean us any, you know, goodwill. So I don't have to convince too many people of that. Right? And I think in a lot of your communities, that debate is actually happening, but you just don't have it openly. Right? That struggle is actually taking place, but you just don't have it, you know, like in your face. Right? Uh, so it's hidden either, you know, through institutional mechanisms and means of kind of perpetuating those old legacies and these old practices. Uh, or there's the, the other side of it, which you can't legislate away per se. You have to work your way out of it, which is the, the subconscious aspects of, you know, uh, racism, you know, sexism, those kind of things which are much more deeply ingrained in this or that law. Uh, they're much more ingrained as an aspect of social practice and take a lot more than changing a law to uproot and get rid of. Um, so, um, that is one thing that is very clear in our context, which uh, despite what it has enabled us to do on a certain level in Mississippi, I don't wish that upon y'all, right? I don't wish that upon y'all. But I do think that there are ways in which, at least from the left, we have to do, we have to do a lot of work to, to come to a deeper level of political clarity about what we're struggling for and very clearly what we're struggling against. I would put more emphasis on what we're struggling for, right, because the, the against piece uh, can be sometimes easily compromised away, uh, which actually doesn't strengthen our position on creating an alternative. And if we really want to be focused on creating an alternative, we got to lead with the alternative, not lead with the defense. Right, that would be a, a principal thing that I would try to like share in part. That I think uh, it took us several different kind of defeats to get to that conclusion ourselves. Um, and I think one of the, to me, one of the things uh, some of the folks I've been organizing with, uh, I think if there was a critical piece that changed what we were doing to, to get to this point now, and we still got a long way to go in terms of trying to accomplish the vision that we set out for ourselves. But the critical thing was we started asking ourselves a different set of questions, right? And the different set of questions led to different types of habits and the different sets of conclusions to be drawn from those habits. So before, and I'm not putting this down in any form or fashion, but before, uh, or saying this in a demeaning way, but before, we, we had a very much like a protest-oriented mentality, right? Like that was kind of how we engaged in the world, even though we had a convert, you know, like our politics in, in statement where it was about building power for black people, right? But the actual practice of trying to build institutions that would, would lend power to black people was often, you know, very minimal, right? Um, and part of it was, uh, some of the skills necessary for that we didn't have. And I would argue on to a certain level some of the, the, the things associated with developing those skills we didn't believe that we could do. Despite the rhetoric, we really didn't believe that we could do it. Right? And so you fall back on a lot of times the thing that you know best, particularly in, when times get rough, you're going to go back to your old habits real quick. Um... So you kind of fall back upon that, even though you're articulating the politics in a position which says, I'm trying to go towards something different. So you have to really do some deep 
investigation of yourself and your own practice to do something different. And the things that, that forced us, uh, the organizations that I was with at the time, uh, that forced us to, to look and do things differently were September 11th and Hurricane Katrina. Like those two things forced two different types of questions upon us. You know, one rooted in, in uh, uh, our history. Uh, and so uh, uh, I come out of a, a left political tendency, uh, which, which most people are revolutionary nationalism. But there was a particular variant of that, the New African Independence Movement, that all my life I've been in, in was born into in some, you know, I was literally born into it. Uh, but clearly I believed in it myself as I got older uh, and took up the practice and took, took that up. And in being a part of that political tradition, um, you know, I consider myself quite literally, I'm a child of COINTELPRO. How many of you know what COINTELPRO is, number one? Okay, that's a good sign. Um, so COINTELPRO, for those of you who don't know, was the FBI's counterintelligence program. Now, they'll give you this narrative that like that program started in the 50s, which is a lie. Um, they that started even before there was a FBI, these types of practices, right? Uh, but they developed, a, they, the FBI, under the leadership of Diego Hoover, developed a specific program initially to go after uh, the Communist Party and, and uh, the various socialist strands and anarchists, you know, in the 1950s, uh, uh, in the height of, of the McCarthy era. And a large part of it was uh, seeing that some aspects of the McCarthy practices were actually kind of winding down. Uh, but his deep kind of anti-communism, like he wanted to keep that going, uh, even when he know he, he couldn't necessarily win the public support for it, because McCarthy himself wound up getting discredited, right? So why throw the baby out the bathwater, I think was his articulation. So that might be discredited in the public, but I can do it in private. And the COINTELPRO was an operation which intentionally uh, tried to spy on folks, and they spied on everybody they could spy on. Uh, um, and where that didn't work, uh, it were, or where it wasn't always effective, they infiltrated organizations by putting members in those organizations with the intense purpose of sowing disunity and disruption. And then when that wasn't necessarily effective, they would go to every measure of public kind of discrediting to straight out assassination, right? So uh, as a kid and, you know, family members for generation being part of radical organizations. You know, I was several occasions where they bust down my door looking for this member or that member or doing X, Y, and Z, sometimes just to terrorize people and keep you off guard for a number of different things. So all that to say, September 11th, with that experience, it was one of these things of understanding, particularly given the rhetoric of what was being pushed in the 1990s from, from more right-wing you know, fashions, and if you want to go back and look some of that up, look up the, the project for a new American century, where, you know, uh, a certain set of forces clearly articulate if they had the opportunity, you know, what they were planning on doing. And there's a version of the of, of what became the Patriot Act is right there in there. They laid it pretty much out, and there was an argument after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, that, that some of the neocons were running, it was like, well, why waste an opportunity? Right? Why waste an opportunity? The world is ours now, uncontested, and we can reshape it, remold it, you know, how we want. We just need justifiable excuses to do so. Like, that was literally, like, the argumentation that was being made very publicly in the 1990s. So when September 11th struck, we were like, this is their opportunity. And they're going to make all the things that were once illegal with COINTELPRO legal. So that's the other thing about that. Technically, COINTELPRO was not legal. They did it anyway, but it technically wasn't legal. So I want you to remember that. Uh, Patriot Act made all that and then some legal. So we didn't say, it, well, we can't operate in the same way, uh, you know, because they're going to be coming after left groups and radical groups in an in a entirely different way. And we change, I mean, so many things including the language that we speak, changed. Like left political language now is profoundly different than it was just, let's say, 20 years ago. Um, so it's interesting for me to go back and, and read, you know, some of my own writings from, say, like 20 years ago, 
And I'm like, oh, I remember that person. You know, I remember that that writing. And it's interesting. It's like, well, I still believe in that stuff, but I didn't got so ingrained in having to articulate certain, you know, principles and ideas differently that I'm like, I'm not even sure I'm talking about the same thing anymore. You know, uh, uh, at least the public doesn't necessarily understand what I mean uh, by certain things, right? So, um, and that's something to watch, you know, and, and, and be mindful of, particularly in our present era, because um, one of the beauties and the dangers that we have now is that we can communicate with each other instantaneously almost anywhere on the planet. But all that is information that they gather and monitor and store. So, you know, they no longer need the FBI or the CIA in the way that they used to because we actually provide them with all that information uh, at our willing discretion. And some of y'all remember, did you see, how many people here watched any part of the Mark Zuckerberg little testimony? Was it last week, a week ago? And another one asked him, you know, uh, is this not spying? And what was his answer? Anybody know what his, remember what his answer was? He said, no, 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 no. This is not spying at all. Because people choose to share that information. <laughs> so the difference is, if it was spying, you didn't choose to give me the information. I had to extract it from you through typically some old school illegal way. And then find something to hang you with, you know, uh, uh, through some legal process or manipulation or another. We said, no, no, this is nothing like spying because people choose to give us that information. So if you want to tell me where you're at, what you're eating, and what you're watching, and what you're playing, and who you know, and what their phone numbers are, and where they live, and give me your, all your contact uh, uh, information and address book and your whole web of social networks, you've chosen to do that. Right? So that's what he's basically saying. So it's like one of these things of, uh, from a political tradition, I've always been like, you know, we all need to kind of get off Facebook, you know, but then it's like if, if you're not on it, you're not necessarily connecting with folks that it would be hard to keep up with. So it's a genius little trap that they've come up with, you know, here that uh, um, some of the old folks who were trying to set up systems to monitor everybody, I'm sure would relish, like, y'all pull that off masterfully when you <laughs> criticize me for trying to do it in Germany or, you know, yeah. other places. You know, so it's like that was a brilliant trick. But anyway, kind of <laughs> off to the side. So um, then the other thing was, was Katrina. And that was a big wake-up call on a number of different levels. Um, to try to summarize it, number one, uh, climate change was not something that was going to happen in some future that it was now. Two, that, that it already had an impact on our people, on our community, right now. Three, the United States government did not care. Literally did not care. Four, that it was experiment to find out to what extent could they get away with not caring. Right? That was the, the, the piece that I think for me, and I was, was wind up being, uh, I was a national organizer at the time for the Malcolm X grassroots movement, and so that was part of my charge was to, to go to places like this and do work, so I got there fairly quickly. Um, yeah, and it was, it was painfully clear uh, that I was uh, in a conflict zone that was not called a conflict zone, that was not officially being treated as a conflict zone. And it's a masterful thing, why I'm relating these two stories, the masterful thing of how they painted that picture without actually calling it that. But if we go back and you look at the certain things, particularly look at um, Spike Lee's first film on uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. I forget what it's tied. Uh, when the levees broke. When the levees, yeah, when the levees broke. So if you go back and you remember the scene when the black general shows up, and he's making all the troops put down their weapons. Y'all remember that? Did any of y'all find that odd? I mean, think about it. That was a straight-up military occupation on U.S. soil. 
and they were treating people who are technically U.S. citizens like they were foreign combatants. And the media just glossed over that. Just totally glossed over that. You know, like, oh, we, we just going, you know, that's just a minor incident and we're going to kind of move on. But the danger is with that kind of stuff, if we don't question it, we, it becomes normal. Right? And so I would argue, you know, to try to connect some things. Um, I'm not saying this in this conspiracy theory. I don't believe in conspiracy. When you organize, you don't need conspiracy, and these folks are organized. Um, but we've been, we've been uh, conditioned in certain ways to be prepared for Donald Trump. Right? We've been conditioned. And the problem, I think, now is we actually being further conditioned to accept it. You know, almost like it's comedy or spectacle. Right? But the end result is that some people are going to be, going to suffer from, it, from that. And if they can continue to make that suffering somewhere external, then many of us will find that acceptable and tolerable. Because we don't have, we're not engaged in a real practice of solidarity. So I'm coming back to that point. Since we're not engaged in real practices of solidarity in concrete way, things that happen to other people are external to me. You know, they don't really matter. And they, you know, they're of no particular worse unless, unless they directly hurt me. You know, or somebody I know and love, right? And which means that you can tolerate a human happen. Right? You can tolerate a Congo happening. You can tolerate a Haiti happening. Right? Uh, a, because a lot of us, I think, even on the left, we, like, we, we feel so powerless that we don't, well, I don't know what I can do anyway to stop it or intervene it. So I might have a kind of a, a moral or even a political commitment to trying to understand it or study it, but I don't know in the active real world what I can do. So I just kind of, you know, it is what it is and, you know, kind of feeling, feeling powerlessness. Um, or a lot of people just become so desensitized, it's like, well, that's, that's just politics. That is what it, what it is and what it amounts to. You know, but think about what that means when, when, you know, he's running around talking to the police like, yeah, y'all can rough people up and beat them up. Right? Now, to some white people, they may not mean much of shit. But when I heard that, you know, I was like, okay. I know what that means, you know. The dogs is loose. Y'all can have fun, and, and, and we're not going to persecute. We're not going to say nothing, you know, uh, Put them in a place. That's basically the politics to clear the dog whistle they got, you know, set up with a little slide, little comment, right, which means different things in different communities based upon your positionality and your history. But it, the point is, for all of us, to a certain extent, it got normalized, right? That's the same thing with the wall. You know, so much now to the point is the, the Democratic Party opposition is like, well, let's just trade some DACA for the wall. As opposed to allegedly a year ago, they were against it. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Now we all accepting that there's going to be a wall. Right? So you can't call him the thing about people, oh, he's ineffective. No, he's not. That, that, that cat is pretty effective at what he's doing. And there's a method to his madness. He's not a fool. He's not an idiot. He's not stupid. He's not irrational. He's actually pretty good at what he does. And part of what he's, what he's there to do is dismantle all of the social programs and the gains from the New Deal and from the Great Society. That is his political mission. And if you look at it and measure him by to what extent are they destroying the EPA, to what extent they're destroying public education, to what extent they're destroying public housing, right, to what extent are they robbing people with that, with that tax grab, you know, he's actually doing a pretty good job. Not for me and you, but... You know, by, by what he said he was going to do, right? He's, he's doing it, you know. So, uh, and I think we need to act, stop acting surprised. Like, well, why, why are you doing this? He told us he was going to do these things. So in this regard, he's like, I said I was going to do it. And at least I'm making an effort. And the critical thing about that is a, there's a political lesson I want to draw for our side. Because I think the critical thing uh, about that to where I, I don't think He's going to lose most of his base in any form or fashion if he keeps this, this trend up. It's because despite how the other side of the equation wants to say, well, he's a pathological liar and all this other kind of stuff, in terms of his actual campaign promises, 
he's made diligent effort to actually execute it. Now, he hasn't always succeeded. Clearly, like he didn't succeed with the health care piece, but he definitely went after it. Like, he made good on going after it, right? And it's not over yet, you know. You know, he's going to try again. He's going to find a new strategy and a new way, and they're going to try again. And I think the critical piece that I want to learn is something that, that one I want to share that, that I think we tried to learn from that, from a vastly different set of principles, of course, was to the extent that we've articulated a vision and program uh, uh, for us that, that it was a Jackson Cush plan. Ultimately, we should be measured by the extent that we actually have set out to actually execute it in practice. Right? With practice being the ultimate criteria of evaluation. Right? And it's presenting an alternative practice that we think will move people who normally don't get moved to engage in politics. And when I say politics, I am not meaning that in any form or fashion around electoral politics. Right, electoral politics is a, to to me a, a minimal aspect of being a political subject, and to me, I would argue being a political subject is a, somebody who engages in social solidarity with the people around you. Like that be, is what becomes a, the quintessential political act because it means you have to work with people, you have to be in relationship with people, and not just the people in your household or in the people in your family, but other people in your community. And you got to deal with all the contradictions of working with people, right? Uh, and everything that comes with that, right? All the arguments and the disagreements, et cetera, you got to, all the conflicts, you got to deal with that, right? But there has to be a democratic principle to engaging with that. That, to me, is what I'm saying by, by being involved in politics. Best ideas around what the future could be and do it boldly, then I think people move to that. People gravitate to that. And if there's anything from, you know, I would say some of the last couple of years in Jackson, I think we, we've done that to a degree. I would like to see us do more of it in a certain way. Like, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We done made a lot of mistakes. We're going to make a lot more, you know. Uh, but I think the critical piece is not being scared to make mistakes, right? Because I've, I've seen a lot of some of the work we made, we've done before, you know, of, well, we don't want to say this because it might alienate this, or we don't want to say that because it might, you know, move people in a particular way, as opposed to, well, let's say clearly what we think, and then let's engage people in honest conversations about, about that, right? And so let's put forth our sharpest ideas and then be willing to engage people in open and honest debate around it, and then let things move. But like trying to tailor certain things to sound more appealing so it doesn't attract people, it doesn't scare people, I think I'm art that ultimately don't work, right? And I think it doesn't speak to a, to a certain level of honesty in politics, actually, right? Because then people are like, well, if you, if you meant this when you said that, like, now that I know you mean this, I'm not quite sure if I trust you, you know, what you're saying and what you're doing. You either kind of alluded me along or just tried to use me as, as some kind of political fodder, you know, and I didn't really have the opportunity to say whether I agree with you or disagree with you on the actual, you know, core piece of what you're articulating, right? And I think for us to a certain extent, and this is one thing I think would be good about the long history of that long precedes me, is, you know, that political tradition as it emerged as a, as a visible thing in, in Mississippi in the early 1970s, it was a minority position. That was a minority position. It wasn't in a majority, right? Uh, uh, not by far, it wasn't a majority. And it was only by folks settling in, taking root, doing long-term community work that you could have anything possible, like Chokwe, who was clearly associated with, with all the politics of the Republic in New Africa, that he could step out in front of the community, ask people to take that risk, and then people be buying into it on the basis of, I know who you are, you know, I know who you are. Other people might say, you know, certain crazy, but you've been here, you've been doing this work, we know what the work is about, you know, it's been steady, it's been consistent, I know who you are. 
Uh, and that's, I'm voting for that in our articulation of moving that forward. Uh, and that, I think, is a clear lesson that we would try to impart to everybody, you know, uh, 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 baby, really. Uh, we are, we'll be four years old on May 1st, right? That's our, that's our four-year birthday. Um, and uh, we were built very explicitly to serve the function of building up one aspect of the Jackson Cush plan, which was building the solidarity economy portion of that plan. Now, what does that mean? So um, we viewed uh, the solidarity economy as uh, a bottom-up way to build the construction of a post-capitalist alternative. That is how we view it, very openly and honestly. Now, we believe that we're working towards the process, and don't we don't believe in this? I don't believe necessarily like a phase theory, but I think there are certain kind of benchmarks, and that's what maybe old left debate that y'all might want to entertain or not. But um, you know, I do think that there are phases of transition from the basic elements of developing the the muscles and the habits of, of transforming your workplaces, transforming your work environment, transforming your working relationships in a much more democratic way. Like, that's a cornerstone basic of what we call economic democracy, right? That's the basic foundation. And that, that, in our view, has a goal of transforming the relationships overall in society of production. And the things that we are ultimately, on our end, trying to eliminate uh, uh, is the gross inequity and inequality that exists within a society based on who owns and who does not own, right? Uh, so that's like a first step in that process. Now we see it as a as a way of building and, and, and ultimately transforming us, the economy from the ground up to be a construction towards socialism. But not in the old school sense that you would understand it. Let me be clear about that. Because one of the things that we've grown to deeply understand of in pushing ourselves and interrogating further and, and really learning and trying to learn as much as possible from indigenous worldviews and perspectives around how we have to relate to each other and the earth profoundly differently, that we're not trying to replicate some of the, the old school way in, in which socialism was articulated by many, which is you take all the capitalist methods of production and you just distribute the, the, the surplus differently, right? Because that was still just an extractive system, just looking at, at the earth as something you constantly take, take, take from. And it was constantly something that only serves human needs as if we're the only species on this planet that really matter, right? That part where, like, no, we got to have a whole new articulation. So our articulation of that is eco-socialism. It's a great word. It's a fancy word. We don't know what the hell that means yet, <laughs> right? We don't really don't know what that means yet other than the principles of trying to do it differently with this view in mind. Like how we get there, we ain't got no magic book or no practices on on anything we making this up as we go along and we hope y'all join in that journey you know with us in some uh, uh, perspective um, and I've read a whole bunch of books on it I, I've learned a lot from them but have you met some of the authors and be like you know this sounds good uh, but it's gonna be profoundly different when, when somebody tries to put it in practice um, so join us in the practice of it not just the intellectual work of it with some trying to push some of them in that vein so uh, being young uh, and trying to be strategic in that regard, one of the first things that we really committed ourselves to was buying land, buying land uh, for a, a number of different reasons. But uh, first and foremost, uh, coming from our political tradition of land being the basis of independence, that ultimately means if you don't control land, you don't, have, you don't control your own means of subsistence and survival, right? And those who do control it, you know, can dictate to you whatever they want, whether you're going to eat, whether you're going to live there, et cetera. So that was a, a, a kind of for us a no-brainer. Like, we, this is what we're going to do. This is why. And if we, we, we have it, then we can do different things on it over the course of time, and we can experiment on it. So there was a story that you were offering, uh, and you probably would tell it better about uh, – uh, we, or do you want me to mention it? Oh, about the, the development in downtown. Yeah, like why, yeah. why, why certain businesses oh, that weren't, you know. Yeah, so um, 
I was sharing with Conley before he started about um, how when we would go back down to Mississippi, we, would know, we noticed that there was a lot of development in the downtown square, um, lots of businesses, and one business in particular stood out to me was um, a soap um, making business. So this woman sold all these, you know, frou-frou soaps. And I thought, well, what kind of, how can she sustain her business in the town of 10,000 in that little area? How many people are interested in soap? Well, because I'm so inquisitive, I started asking around. Well, she wasn't paying any rent because her family had owned the building that she was in for years. And that was the case for many of the, uh, 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 and she was white. I don't need to say that. That was, that's a given. <laughs> um, and so that was the case for many of the businesses in the area. And my cousins who were born and raised in Mississippi, they, you know, we were talking about it and they said, oh, you know, I wondered how they were staying in business. They just thought that these people were really productive and you know, industrious and that's how they were able to run these businesses um, and, and be able to afford the rent. But you, anybody can run a business, retail business, if they're not paying any rent because it's a building that their family has owned since the beginning of time. <laughs> yeah. Right, and when you ain't got to pay rent, um, you're just worried about your utilities, some insurance. You can run a nice little hobby business too. You're selling soap that only you like, you know, maybe, you know what I mean? Um, you know, or you ship it in on eBay to, and nobody in, this, in the community comes and buys anything and be perfectly happy, right? Because you're actually not engaged in a market relationship with the people in your community. The supply and demand factor is not even coming into a core because I, I, I'm sitting on a means of production. I can do what I want. Right? You know, I'm quite sure she got an income someplace else anyway, right, some other way. You know, so this is a hobby. You know, this is, this, this is a hobby. We're not even a business on a certain level. This is a hobby. But other people on the other side of the equation looking in that mirror mystified, like, how in the hell, you know, like, I want to sell business, you know what I mean? I want to, you know, own my own thing and open the door and go to work when I want to go to work. And if I don't want to work today, I don't show up to work. Like, I'd like to do that, right? But and most people mystify because they're not looking at the material foundation, right? So all she got to really worry about on a certain level is depreciation of the building, right? Both condition-wise and, and material-wise. That's the only thing she really got to worry about with that, with that particular piece. So that's a, that's a grounding that we, we tried to base ourselves in. Of look, look, this is one of the missing factors of black folks trying to do economic development over the centuries is certain basic inputs we just don't have control over. And when, even when we have gotten control over, there's been big movements to either burn it all down, right, or move us out, yep. or force us out and push us out. Ain't got nothing to do with a lack of skill or a lack of ingenuity or that people lazy or that they don't know nothing. That's all bullshit, right? Complete and utter bullshit. So there's been many efforts of trying, in every black community that I can tell you, you think of, there's somebody out here you know, tried to come up with a business plan and actually put it and move people together, couldn't get the capital, couldn't get the political clearance, couldn't get the permit, you know, couldn't pay off this criminal to, you know, uh, uh, stay out of their pockets, you know what I mean? You got all that which is a, a, a hindrance to certain communities making certain types of advances within the system that we presently have. So I think was knowing all this history, how do we set the first example of changing that dynamic? Right? And so we made some conscious choices to do a deep level of self-exploitation, which I don't advise, but sometimes is necessary. I'm saying that we're not going to pay ourselves. We're going to take all that and, and buy, you know, buildings. And we have to make our living this first couple of years some other way. But to the extent that we can get resources, we, we aim at them and direct them in that. So it's a long-term investment, trying to play the long game as long as possible. Right? Uh, but within that, also trying to work and do... Uh, uh, various forms of cooperative development. And that's a challenge, you know, because there, there actually are a certain amount of skills that you want and you need people to, to develop uh, and grow with. And, and uh, one of the big challenges that, that we are learning, you know, the, the theory and the practice, there's always a big gap between the two. There's always a big gap between the two. And the practice of democracy is actually much harder than what it sounds like, as I was trying to allude to uh, uh, earlier, right? Uh, and the way I put it, 
we are all learning how to be democratic. We don't know that. I don't know how to be democratic. I never lived in a democratic society. Right? I don't have, other than what I'm stumbling my way through, I have no experience doing that any more than any of you do. Right? So, enjoy. I mean, that's the part, you know, at a certain point, you stop being frustrated and enjoy it. That's, that's part of the process. Like, we own this, if we're serious about it, we own this journey. That's all part of the journey. Right? So, for us, uh, the little things we've been able to accomplish, uh, catering, uh, urban farming, uh, uh, composting in a, in a uh, um, lawn care uh, unit, and then we're, we're working on developing now, which is a big experiment, uh, which is community production, right, which is based upon uh, 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 the simplest way. I've been trying the whole trip to figure out how do you say what we're trying to do in like a sentence or two. But, but basically it's, it's 3D, well, no, that's, that's, you can't reduce digital, uh, uh, digital, uh, uh, digital production to 3D printing. So 3D printing is a part of it, uh, but there's other dimensions of it around precision cutting. And I think the synthesis is, is how do you digitize information of real objects in the world or things that you can design and program from your imagination and use a combination of precision techniques and tools to make almost anything, to borrow that from Neil Gershenfield, right? That's basically where we're at. And the technology exists to do that. And some of it has actually existed for, for a minute, right? To the first earlier version of 3D printers to a, to a certain extent, uh, which was originally called computer numeric design, right? Uh, that's been around since the 1980s, right? That's some, some elements have been around for a minute. Uh, but the cost of the production of the units has come down extremely low to, to such a level that, that we collectively here could decide that's something we want to do uh, and, and build up a process to start a business doing that. So you, we're in an age now where actual industrial scale production is affordable to communities in a way you couldn't even imagine this 50, 60, 100 years ago, right? You'd have to have major capital investment in everything that comes with the bank owning you, you know, in order to do that. The threshold around that has changed. But that's a, that's a positive thing, but there's some other dangers. And we got into it for both, for both this reason, but also because of the dangerous component of it. And that is uh, this technology threatens to put millions of people out of work very quickly, very, very quickly. And the, the, the thing about it is that in putting millions of people out of work, the actual system will not miss a beat. It's the way at least is organized now through capitalist enterprise. It wouldn't miss a beat in terms of actual production. Right? There'd still be plenty enough food for everybody to eat. Most of it going in the trash like it's going in the trash now. So all the waste that we, we the system produces on purpose. Uh, that all will still be there. But without jobs, you won't have the income to access it. Right? So there, there's a, some serious deep crisis that the system has created for itself, per its own laws and dynamics, that a few people told us about a long time ago. Um, that's all there. Right? And so it's, it's not by accident that all these folks in Silicon Valley are talking about universal basic income. Right? Elon Musk and all his genius and arrogance, you know, like he's the straight up talking about, yeah, people ain't going to have no money. If I want them to buy my stuff, we got to give them a little bit of money to, to buy the stuff to keep this ball rolling. And in the meantime, if all that collapsed, I'm going to Mars with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck to the rest of y'all, right? <laughs> Hope y'all make it, you know. If this don't work, I got a backup plan. You know, that's literally how him and some of his friends are, are, are thinking. And so they're having that level of conversation and discussion. Are we? Are we? So we're trying to get into this experiment and say we're going to put ourselves in the middle of it as most as we can and try to re-articulate it in a way that we can do this on the basis of human design, servicing human needs, not serving the needs of the market. We're going to have to do some of that because, you know, the, the community production side is going to have to be subsidized. That's a reality, some form or fashion. So we still going to have to engage in making some profits to be able to do something else. But the gradual piece of what I was changing, telling you about that kind of systems 
change from economic democracy towards a deliberate grass or bottom of, of socialism. We think this is a core component of it, right, in such a way that we can ensure that we can produce enough to take care of our basic community needs without much of a shortfall. We can do it by utilizing less energy, right, and less carbon emissions. We can do it with less waste because it's production on demand, not just a bunch of stuff that's going to sit in the grocery store and rot if nobody uh, uh, purchase it while there's hundreds of people starving outside, right? That's the system that we have, right? Um, so let's produce to what we need, and that takes less of a toll on Earth. So, you know, these are the things that we at least are trying to think about uh, uh, in the design. And the one thing nobody can accuse us of, I, I think, is, you know, we don't dream small. We try to dream big. Uh, but I think the critical piece of that is we dream. And that's something I don't see the left doing a lot. Going back to that point, we, we're stuck in the de defense. And what is, our, what is our offense? What are we dreaming of? Right? And just, you know, I would put it out. People can like it or not like it. But I think it's true. So let's say, you know, the Democrats take the House and the Senate back in, in November. And then they get the White House back in, in 2020. What program do they have? What's, what's this? <laughs> what program do they have? <laughs> like, what's the future looking like? What's, you know? What's the program? <laughs> so uh, I'm looking for a program. I'm trying to develop a program. I hope y'all join us in, in developing this program. So, our program, not you know, a collective program that we can all, uh, uh, you know, build together and serve our community's needs. Like so, I'm in with that.